Hello, in this video I want to talk about one of my favorite things in math, quaternions. Quaternions are this thing in math that when I was introduced to them it blew my mind. So they are in essence a step up from imaginary numbers. And I still remember being in high school when my math teacher introduced me to this idea of imaginary numbers. This idea that, okay, so all these numbers I've ever dealt with, the one, the one half, the pi, like all the normal numbers. And he said, that's not all there is. There's this whole separate set of numbers that have a couple special unique properties. Here they are, something you never heard of. And I was like, that is cool. Well, then I got to college and somewhere in college, a professor said, hey, there's this thing called quaternions. It is a type of number you have never heard of, but they exist and they are useful and they are used in math. So I want to just introduce the basics of quaternions, um, not really even talk about the math of it so much, just a little bit of history and the idea behind them. So first, we're going to start with a quote. There are so many interesting, funny, dramatic quotes uh, about math and through math. So this is a letter that Sir William Rowan Hamilton was writing to one of his children. And by the way, Hamilton is the one who discovered quaternions. So, every morning in the early part of the above cited month on my coming down to breakfast, your little brother William Edwin and yourself used to ask me, Well, Papa, can you multiply triplets? Whereto I was always obliged to reply with a sad shake of the head, No, I can only add and subtract them. What was he talking about? For many years, Hamilton was trying to search for this idea of the quaternions. The idea of quaternions is a three-dimensional imaginary number. Okay, what do we mean? Well, we have the real numbers. That's what we know of. That's the 1, the 2, the 0, the negative 1, the, the pi, the square root of 5, the normal numbers. They exist on the number line, one-dimensional, 1D. And then... What a lot of us are familiar with is the imaginary numbers. The complex is maybe the more technical term, and that's the i, the 3i, the 5 plus 2i, the 3 minus 7i. And those exist on the complex plane. We can do a two-dimensional graph. Not going into that too much, but on the x-axis is the normal number, and the y-axis is the imaginary. So if I want to put 5 plus 2i, I could plot it by going 5 on the real and up here, and that would be my 5 plus 2i. So you can see there that I've created something in two dimensions. So Hamilton's insight was, well, surely there's a three-dimensional imaginary number. And then that thing would exist in three dimensions. So when I started talking about those numbers, I would have the 2D plane, but then I would have this third axis, and to plot these numbers, I would use the three dimensions. So he was searching for that three-dimensional imaginary number. And it makes sense if the general form of the real number, it's some number A, imaginary is A plus BI, so one imaginary part, he said, well, this three-dimensional thing should be A plus BI plus CJ like two uh, quote-unquote imaginary part. And so he worked with that for years, literally years. He was struggling with that. And like in this quote, he could only find ways to add and subtract them, but he could not find a way to multiply his triplets. And when we talk about that, we mean it's going to behave according to algebra rules and do certain technical math things in a correct way. And he couldn't find the way to get the general rules for multiplying them to work. And this left him in a bind because he really wanted to find this because there's applications of this three-dimensional imaginary number. Rotational applications is one. If we think of something in imaginary number here, if I have this imaginary number two, well, it's actually a real number, but if I have two and I go two and I multiply it by an imaginary two i, I get two i. Okay, but what if I have 2i and I multiply by i again? I have 2i squared, and you know that i squared equals negative 1, so now I have negative 2. So now 
my arrows pointing like this. Well, what if I take negative 2 and I multiply by i? I have negative 2i. Where would I plot that? Well, I would go down 2 to negative 2i. Do you see what's happening here? Every time I multiply by i, it creates a 90 degree rotation. I'm going quick over this because I just want to introduce this idea that when I multiply by imaginary numbers, it creates a two dimensional rotation. And you can multiply by different imaginary numbers to get different rotations. For example, one plus i, if you multiply any number by that, it's gonna create a 45 degree rotation. So Hamilton wanted that idea, but in three dimensions. He wanted to create this number that when I multiply, it's gonna rotate a vector or a number in three dimensions every time I multiply by it. So he kept searching and searching, he was trying with this a plus b i plus c j, and it just was not working. Until he realized he didn't need one, two, three parts for a three dimensional he needed a fourth part. As soon as he put in the fourth part, it worked. And you can see why it took him so long to think of that because it's not intuitive to think you need four parts for a three-dimensional number. It doesn't necessarily follow the pattern. But he realized that that would solve his problems with multiplying. It wasn't only that insight though. Really, it was this equation right here that was the insight, the problem solver that allowed him to multiply these three dimensional imaginary numbers. There's a story behind his insight to that, one of those great math stories. He was trying to solve this, he had been working on it for years, and then one day he was gonna go out to the opera with his wife. So they finished dinner and they started walking over to the opera house. And as he was passing this bridge, he all of a sudden shouted, oh, I've got it! And he dropped down to the stones and he carved into the stone of the bridge i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals i j k which equals negative one so the story is he sat down carved that and said that is the insight that's how i do it and there's still this plaque that is shown in the photo marking the site where he kind of had the insight and he discovered that 16th of october 1843 and that insight kind of unlock the quaternions for him. And I love things like that in math because sometimes when you're thinking really, really hard about something, you can't get the answer. But then your subconscious is working on it. And when you're not even thinking about it, when you're on the way to the movies or the opera, boom, it comes to your mind. So that was cool. So he realized the form has to have those four parts. So if I have a quaternion, it's going to look something like maybe three plus two i minus four j plus 5k, and that will be one number right there, one quaternion. But what this equation says, i squared equals negative one, kind of like we know with imaginaries. But each imaginary part, when you square it, it's gonna equal negative one. But more than that, the i, j, k, you multiply all three together, and it's still gonna equal negative one. From that central equation comes the more evident idea that is central to quaternions. The fact that i times j equals k, but negative j i equals k as well. Or let me put that another way. i j equals k, but j i equals negative k. Or we have j times k equals i, but k times j equals negative i. We have k times i equals j, but i times k equals negative j. So one thing to get from that, you multiply two of the parts, it gets the third one. Okay, so you multiply two of the parts, it gets the, left, the one that is left out. Also, what is this telling us? When I change the order, it gives me a different answer. It is non-commutative. So multiplication with quaternions is non-commutative. And that's a special thing, a very important property with them. They lose commutativity. So if I have two quaternions and I multiply them, q1 times q2, that does not equal q2 times q1. They lose commutativity. And these are called quaternions. We label them with h equals. The h is standing for Hamilton, so he gets the big h to stand for the set of all quaternions. 
So there is a way to put quaternions in matrix form, and it's interesting because there are many links between matrices and quaternions. A lot of their operations behave the same way. Because if you study matrices or vectors, a whole lot of connection between quaternions, vectors, matrices, it's really a fascinating thing. Because if you have studied matrices, you know that the columns or the rows in them can stand for vectors. If I do V cross W with two vectors, I know that that does not equal vector W cross vector V. So vector cross products are not commutative as well, just like quaternions are not commutative. And that's because, well, not necessarily because, but there's this link. You can take quaternions and there is a vector form for them, just like there is a matrix form for them. And not getting into all those, but there's just this link between quaternions and matrices and vectors that is fascinating. So I've written that quaternion can be this matrix, a two by two matrix of alpha, beta, negative, beta, conjugate, alpha, conjugate. What is all that? Well, the alpha is equal to A plus BI and the beta is equal to C plus DI where the A plus B plus C plus D, all that comes from this general form of the quaternion. Okay, so the A and B come from the first two numbers, the C and D from the second two. The bar, the alpha bar is the conjugate, so that's gonna be A minus BI. Same with beta bar, that's gonna be C minus DI, the conjugate, but then it is negative, so we're going to multiply it all by negative 1 to get negative C plus DI. And those are the parts of your matrix. So this could equal 3 plus 2I if I take this quaternion right here that I wrote. An example matrix would be 3 plus 2I, negative 4 plus 5I, and then the next one is negative B conjugate, so it's B conjugate would be negative 4 minus 5i, so this is going to be 4 plus 5i, and then alpha conjugate is 3 minus 2i. The nice thing of being able to put it in matrix form is then you can multiply quaternions the same way you multiply matrices and with the same rules. I could just leave it in normal form, then I multiply two quaternions, I just multiply with the distributive property, keeping in mind these rules right here. And I could also put it in vector form and then do a cross product between the two vectors to multiply it. So cool, all these links. But again, just talking to the surface level of it. One last idea I want to talk about though is, is there anything beyond quaternions? So we have the real numbers, we have the imaginary numbers, we have the quaternions, and you think, well, at this point, I keep being told by teachers that there's something more, there's something more, there's something more. So is there another dimension, a four-dimensional type of imaginary number? So the reals are of the form A, imaginary is A plus BI. The quaternions are A plus BI plus CJ plus DK. So now you see this pattern, perhaps when I go up one more, the next one is going to have 8. See, I went from one term to two to four, so let's keep doubling. And so we're going to have eight terms. That's the idea, which in this type of notation, it gets kind of messy because it's DK plus EL plus FM plus GN, and that's seven, and then it's HO. So messy notation, they usually use different ones for this because it does exist. And these are called octonians, eight terms. So we call them octonians and they're kind of the next step up. But you say, well, can we go further? Can we go deeper? Can we have the 16 terms, the sixtonians, sixteendonians? No, sorry, that's all. There's only these four. And notice what's happening. The real and imaginaries have everything, but what happens in the quaternions? They lose 
commutativity. Okay, it's kind of like falling apart as you go up in dimensions. With the octonians, guess what? They lose associativity. It's gone. Associativity, if you remember, is the idea that A, A times B times C is the same as A times B times C. It doesn't matter which two I multiply first, it's going to be the same. Well, guess what? With octonians, that does not exist. So I like to think of it as you go higher and higher in these dimensions, it's breaking apart. The rules of algebra are falling apart. And so there are no more algebra systems above that. And a guy named Mr. Graves proved that that's the case. Okay, so it is proved that there's nothing above it. And sure, you can create something above. I can create something with 16 terms and say it's a number, but you cannot create an algebraic system that follows basic algebra laws, and those are stipulated according to, well, there are certain laws and rules to be an algebra system. You cannot do that with a higher dimension one. It just kind of falls apart. It's a really interesting one. So anyways, this is just a basic idea introduction to quaternions, not doing too much of the math, but more of the history uh, and concept before it. And they have always been something so fascinating to me that they exist. Um, and then learning about octonians and all that stuff, just a fascinating topic.